Okay, hi, Liberal Studies, how are you doing? Uh, this is your professor, Selby. This is um, the first of a number of videos I'm going to show you, I'm going to record over the next couple days to help with, uh, uh, to help with your midterm, okay? This video is based on an article I just put up there. It's going to help with the notion of social state a little bit. And it's also going to help with the idea of boosterism, the whole boosterism idea of how do we tell history? Do we tell history from the point of view of sort of the victors, if you will? America is perfect, nothing was ever bad. Do we tell a, a history from the point of view of people on the bottom who weren't treated as well? I mean, to some extent, both of these matter, okay? We don't want to forget that. So, um, my specialty is uh, uh, political theory. Political theory is uh, relates to all the social sciences. And um, uh, today I'm going to be talking about this guy, Alexei de Tocqueville. He's going to come up in this video. And, well, I'll probably just do all of it just straight through in this video now that I think about it. But we'll see. I might break it up into two videos. Um, you know, who was this guy, Alexei de Tocqueville? Well, he's, he wrote, actually, look at this guy. He's a total, <laughs> look at this guy over here. He's totally, like, he's a French aristocrat, okay? That's who he is. Uh, but you know what? He's really smart, and he came to the United States and walked around and looked and made observations and was a profound observer of culture. So, um, you know, he came, he wrote... He saw, okay, these slides are a little bit uh, for a different purpose. So if I don't talk about everything on the slide, that's fine. It might come back a little bit later, okay? But, you know, an ideal type here is the notion of social structure. Remember I talked about, I put that chart on the board, the social structure chart on the board, and I said, you know, there's these kind of like similarities you can find from all hunter-gatherer societies. There's like a lot of things that just kind of, you see over and over again, and then same with agrarian civilizations, and same with uh, nation states, okay? The general things that you find together fit into what Tocqueville would call an ideal type, okay? Which is just, here's a bunch of general stuff that kind of we always see coming together at the same time. Um, Tocqueville traveled far and wide in the United States in the 1830s. He didn't make it to California, but I'm going to apply much of what he says to California, so we're going to see that um, in a moment. Um, he went up to Quebec, out to the west, to New Orleans. He took notes, conducted interviews. Um, where's my cursor? There it is. Um, he also, oh, wrong way, go that way. He also uh, wrote a book. Uh, called, he wrote a book called *Democracy in America*. His friend Gustave de Beaumont writes this book, *Marie or Slavery in the United States*. Today, I'm going to be talking about some of the race, race, racial stuff. Um, *Democracy in America* is today Political Science 101. If you're teaching eighth grade, you actually can pull out, kind of like I have, some sections from this book and use them. Uh, to think about, um, use them to think about what's going on. So um, he was also a great predictor. He saw in, when he published this book in 1835, that uh, the United States and Russia would be the great powers of the 20th century. So he saw the Cold War 150 years, well, 130, 100 years before it started, call it a cool 100, 110 years. And Beaumont, his friend and traveling companion, wrote a book titled Marie or Slavery in the United States. And it's about a biracial couple torn apart by American racial prejudice. Um, broadly speaking, Marie could be put in what's called the slave narrative literature, although it is fictionalized. Um, but it fits into that kind of, it's almost like a romantic novel, but it's a tragedy. So it's, a, it's a, not a happy ending. Um, no, I'm not too worried about, I don't want to, um, well, okay. Um, when, when people tell history, they want to go back to the beginning and they want to say America was always X, right? So that's what everybody wants to say. America was always so equal and perfect. 
And the slides that I'm talking about right now, again, I put them together for a slightly different purpose, but they really help us here. This guy, Louis Hartz, who I'm arguing with in the paper that I put online, he's just a, he comes down to a kind of boosterism version of history. He's telling American history the way we want to tell it to ourselves, really makes us feel good. America was different and special and wonderful and everything was so great, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so uh, Louis Hartz, he identifies this as America being individual, equal, and free. And he calls this, as many people have since him, American exceptionalism. There's this idea that from the beginning, America was different, special, um, more better than everybody else. Um, not too worried about that. Let's move past that. Don't want to do that either. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, I don't want to say, so I, you know, I skipped a few slides here because they don't seem particularly relevant to this, to what I'm trying to do here. Um, but this guy, Louis Hartz, he actually very much um, embraced what Tocqueville was doing, was very inspired by Tocqueville. And the whole point of what I'm going to show you here is that Tocqueville saw both sides of the equation. He saw both the boosterism side of history and the side of history that wasn't so nice, wasn't so great. So while Louis Hartz is right to pull from, you know, this guy Tocqueville, I wrote a book on him. He's kind of, you know, I, a lot of my thinking sort of like follows with patterns that he set up and stuff like that. Um, even though Hartz is right to point to these elements coming from Tocqueville that sort of highlight the uniquenesses of American culture, Tocqueville also saw the other side of the equation, and he saw the limits of American equality. He saw those groups that were excluded, and he actually talked about them as well. Okay, um, uh, uh, so you know one thing that that Hartz really liked is you know Tocqueville wrote the Americans were born equal without having to ever become so. So Hartz really liked that. He thought that was. Um, much more of a sort of nice thing. But you know what? Tocqueville saw the limits to this equality, especially in the South, and as I'm going to also show you in the West with Native American groups, okay? So this set of slides is, is more for the South. I'll move off the slides and get to some other things for us to look at in a moment. But, you know, he really, Tocqueville really saw the limits to um, to uh, the democratic equality and American exceptionalism. Um, so one thing to be really clear about is in the long view, Tocqueville clearly saw the effect of slavery in the United States was, um, he wasn't sure it would lead to a civil war, but he knew it was going to be one of the main uh, conflicts that uh, we would be fighting over. Okay, He thought that the North and South were politically developing in very different directions. He thought the South was dependent on slavery and was not going to give it up without a fight, okay? Um, and he, he um, kind of develops this out in an interesting, interesting way. Now, let me just show you this. Look at this. This is uh, 1870, so this is the period we're just about to hit um, in class. So our midterm takes us right up to basically the Civil War. And of course, California didn't really have that much to do with the Civil War. We had just joined the Union, we're so far away, etc. But look at this railroad map, right? What do you see here? Notice on the top in the Midwest and um, Northwest, Northeast, uh, just completely crisscrossed with railroad lines. And then, of course, you have the Transcontinental Railroad line coming out. And then notice the South. Very few railroad lines, and notice they all lead to um, the ocean or to the north. And what that's telling us is it's telling us that the southern economy was agrarian. They had very little uh, industrial base. They grew products. Products were then moved to ports and shipped north for manufacturing. Or, and this is cotton now, so we're really talking cotton. Or... Um, just, you know, connected straight north through these rail, railways, okay? So, I mean, really clear, stark difference in how the North and South developed economically. And Tocqueville clearly traced this to slavery. 
So I'll show you the, um, the logic here in a minute, but you know, Tocqueville argues that in the South, slavery becomes associated with work. This is a cultural or sociological argument. And the consequence is that white people in a slave owning society uh, come to feel that work is beneath their social standing or status. So basically they then view work as something for slaves to do and it's demeaning to an individual to do a thing that a slave is supposed to do. So therefore, work. You don't work, okay? Um, <clears throat> so um, this is leading us to what I called in class uh, social structure, or what Tocqueville would call social state, okay? In the North, Tocqueville sees a modern, capitalistic, democratic social state. In the South, he really is clear about this. He sees something that looks much more like our second social state of agrarian civilizations. Although they're sort of integrated into a capitalist economy with the North because Southern products are being sold North and then manufactured, etc. Tocqueville very clearly looks at the type of life in the South and he says, ah, this is what, this is how my grandparents lived because he was an aristocrat and pre-French Revolution, aristocrats didn't work. They did whatever they wanted to and other people worked. And he saw very similar, again, think ideal type, think the connection between um, uh, sort of different social, social, similar social systems having similar patterns of behavior, okay? Tocqueville very, very, very clearly saw this um, as basically a racial, um, aristocracy. That's what he saw. Um, some things to keep in mind here. The American Constitution, when it was written, was written to balance power between North and South and big and small states. The three-fifths clause meant that plantation owners and slaveholders got to vote for their slaves, but slaves were only worth three-fifths of a vote. Well, you do that, why? to balance power in the House of Representatives uh, where uh, members are distributed according to population. The Senate as well distributes powers by state, so it's two per state, and there is a very, there's almost a perfect 50-50 balance of power between uh, slave and, um, between uh, slave and um, uh, free states all right up until the eve of the Civil War, okay? Um, okay, um, let's see. Um, in the long view, uh, what we can see here from uh, uh, Tocqueville is that race is a really important category in um, American political development, okay? Tocqueville didn't, didn't live long enough to see the Civil War, he dies basically just when it's about to happen. Um, but uh, he really saw how race was affecting the development of uh, American uh, political science. Um, okay, oh, I didn't put everything in here. I'm gonna go to the article itself now. You can, um, I'll throw these slides up online as well, but I wanna show you some things from the article itself because it'll help you um, make sense of what's going on. Okay, so this is the, uh, the article up on Canvas, okay? Um, uh, the most important part here is um, the African American and Native American groups that were excluded from participation in the Republic represent the second face of American exceptionalism. Not just boosterism history, you also have to do, you know, new history as I have called it. Um, and let's go down. So, you know, there's a bunch of stuff going on here, but what I want to show you is this. You definitely don't need to read this whole article. I would pay attention to the stuff that I'm highlighting for you. Okay. Again, the purpose of this article was somewhat different. I'm going to sort of build from this and get to, uh, here we go. So this is page... Do I have page numbers on here? Um, unclear if I have page numbers on here. 
Um, so this I've kept titled this Social State in Jacksonian America, but um, uh, uh, you know, um, I just called this uh, uh, social structure in class, okay? And what Tocqueville has here, how I've kind of arranged this based upon Tocqueville's works, um, we have each of the three main social structures kind of alive and present in uh, American history circa 1850. And Spain fits in the, um, looks more like what we would call the South. There are some differences, but Spain fits into the South. Um, uh, the North is what Tocqueville would call a democratic social state, what I call just a nation state. That's designed, that's distinguished by uh, formal legal equality. So legally, everyone is an equal citizen and gets to vote. What Tocqueville saw, though, in the North was very high cultural exclusion to non-whites, so Native Americans and African Americans. Very, very strong resistance on an individual level. As I said, there's so to things like marriage or something like that, Tocqueville describes race riots he saw in the North. Um, uh, the ideal type personality um, is uh, the Yankee. The Yankee is pragmatic, commercial, industrious, and individualistic. Okay. The economic style is commercial and capitalistic. In the South, this would also include Spain and also Mexico, so Spanish and Mexico. Formal inequality, meaning some people have more rights than others. Not everyone gets the same amount of rights. So um, in Spanish America, they actually had uh, what they called the caste system, la sistema de castas, as I think what it was called. And they actually had hierarchies of what you're allowed to do, where you're allowed to go, what types of jobs you're allowed to have. They even have these big posters that were made. and. Um, your caste depended on how much Spanish blood you had, whether you're indigenous or African. There were lots of Africans in Mexico as well. Um, interestingly, Tocqueville in the South thought there was a little bit lower cultural exclusion. I don't have time to talk about why that happened, but that's a really important point to keep in mind. It's easy to just trot out the South and say, oh, they're so bad, blah, blah, blah. But when you get right down to it, um, it turns out that, uh, well, it turns out that the story is just more complicated than the easy moralistic uh, way of talking. Um, the ideal the ideal type personality from the South, we also see this in Spain and Mexico, is a kind of aristocratic ideal. Um, the virtues of leadership and nobility, um, also combined with the vices of you know, people who are born into their position. You know, if your dad's wealthy and he spoils you and tells you you're special and it's your life project to lead and all of that kind of stuff, well, maybe that's, um, maybe, maybe that's what you, what, how you adopt, but you might be kind of lazy if you think about it that way, and this does happen. And the economic consequences, whoops, excuse me, is, we lost it, there we go, is agrarian and traditional, okay? Um, so this is what we see in Spain and also Mexican uh, California. We would act, so Mexico was also, um, uh, and Spain, um, a lot of cattle ranching, but that was because there's just a lot of land and it was way easier to, you could have these big herds. Um, lastly, Native American. Uh, social state, what I've called hunter-gatherers. Um, in American history, tribes were recognized as foreign nations. That means Native Americans usually weren't allowed to vote. Um, uh, we would make treaties, but then break treaties, okay? Native Americans faced both, therefore, legal and cultural exclusion. In the North, African Americans were technically allowed to vote, technically amount, allowed to you know, marry, intermarry. We just didn't see very much of it because of the habits, the cultural habits of people were different, okay? The, um, the kind of ideal type personality for the Native American is what I've titled the habits of horseback, although keep in mind that 
riding horses was a thing that came from the New World. So it kind of actually, even that, very much changed what Native Americans um, could do. Um, uh, but a kind of freedom, a, you know, a very kind of pastoral freedom, again, no, no long-standing legal structures, so you don't have written laws, but you do have habitual, uh, what Tocqueville calls mores, what we call mores, which are just cultural rules. You're not supposed to talk to your mother-in-law, right? We talked about that cultural rule. Um, and the economic consequence, non-agricultural, hunting, gathering, but still really manipulating the land quite a bit, okay? Now, where this really matters for Tocqueville is in the, um, uh, or for now, what I want to turn to is I want to turn and look at uh, um, uh, how this affects Native Americans, okay? So I have this little thing I put together to build from uh, uh, my social state guide, okay? And I want to show you, um, Tocqueville was very clear. Tocqueville absolutely knew that um, there was, that basically the Americans and the Spanish started it, so it's not just the Americans. You know, Spain and the spread of disease uh, decimated um, many Native American communities. But when American Americans got here, we did it even worse, okay? Um, it's not a nice part of our history, but the fact of the matter is, under Spanish rule, at least they wanted subjects. Remember, this is imperialism. The, the brothers, the padres, uh, uh, really wanted to convert. They wanted to help the Native Americans. They didn't always have the best ideas of how to do that, but they were sincere in that mission. The white Americans who came in the gold rush, for all intents and purposes, really just didn't care. And not only didn't care, they actively sought to harm Native American communities, and the result is basically a genocide. I'm not saying that because Sac State got sued a few years back. The first time I gave this lecture, someone raised their hand and said, are you saying that because sex state got sued? I was like, oh, I didn't know we had been sued. It was my first semester here. I had no idea. I'm saying that because that's what happened, okay? That's why I say that. So this is what Tocqueville said. I believe the Indian nations of North America are doomed to perish, and that wherever the Europeans shall be established on the shores of, of the Pacific Ocean, that race of man, that race of men will have ceased to exist, okay? Let me give you a little more um, background here on Tocqueville. In addition to this helpful category of social structure that I've teased out, he also talks about, uh, he uses an idea we could call the two natures idea. And the two natures idea is that we all share this physical commonality, a genetic physical commonality. And that's true. We have this sort of general basic genetic physical makeup that doesn't really, that doesn't change couple of really small differences here and there, right? Um, but then we have a second nature, which is a cultural nature, which develop, which is quite changeable, quite malleable. Look at the, that's part of what social state or social structure is cap capturing is the malleability of human nature. And the other thing is, you know, think about all the differences amongst the Native American tribes and all of that. Um, quite a bit of, uh, of differences there that are that are um, uh, relatively obvious. So um, he's working on this this level here of well, there's a common physical nature and then there's kind of a cultural nature. And what he's arguing is that quite frequently we mistake the cultural nature for being the physical nature. And when you see people who are engaging in pseudo scientific racism, they're like, oh, there's differences, ah! right? Tocqueville's having a conniption, his head's about to explode. Why? Well, because he's saying, look, you're mistaking this cultural nature for uh, uh, your physical nature, okay? Yeah, there's a few small differences. Even culturally, the differences nowadays aren't anywhere near to what people say. And, you know, all this race and IQ stuff is total BS. 
and it all disappears once you control for basically economic social standing. So once you control for wealth, all these differences of some races do better on the SAT than others, like disappear, okay? So don't do your stats bad, okay? Um, in Tocqueville's analysis in his book, he um, uh, uh, has this really interesting uh, beginning of this of his analysis of how the Native American genocide is happening, and it's, I call it the scene at the lake. And what he does is he it it it's kind of this like set piece. Maybe it actually happened. Maybe it's just him kind of. Maybe it sort of half happened. You know what I mean? But the story, you know, he tells the story this way. He's traveling through the forest. He's in the west. He basically comes to this watering hole, and he's watching from out in the forest. He's an observer, right? So he's watching from out in the forest, and he sees that there's a few different women there, all of different races, and they've got a baby, and they're doing laundry, and they're playing with the baby, and this, that kind of stuff. And he's saying, look, look, all the different races are here hanging out, getting together. Look at all these things that they have in common. Well, then he emerges from the woods because he kind of wants to go talk to them and they get spooked and they run away. But see, that's him when he arrives. That's him as society. OK, and so in a way, the, what was happening is the women there, the multi-ethnic group of women there, were kind of breaking the social norm. They're hanging out there. They're all hanging out together. But that wasn't the social norm. That was fine when nobody's watching. Once they realize that somebody's there watching, all of a sudden they have to obey the cultural logic of don't hang out together, and they get scared, and they all um, they all disappear. Um, by the way, you know, Negro is not a term that people use these days. I want to be really clear about that. Tocqueville wrote his book 150 years ago. At the time, it was fine. Today, you don't say that, right? If you're black, you can say that to your friends. That's it, okay? Um, and if you're white, you can call your friends white trash. If you're not white, don't call your friends white trash unless you're really close with them, okay? Um, so, you know, uh, you know, um, I remember that while I was traveling through the forest, which still co cover the state of Alabama, I arrived one day at a big log house of a pioneer. I did not wish to penetrate into the dwelling of the American, but retired to rest myself a while on the rain, on the, on a margin of the spring, which was not far off uh in the woods while i was in this place which was in the neighborhood of of the creek territory an indian woman appeared followed by a negress and holding the hand of a little white girl of five or six whom i took to be the daughter of the pioneer all three came and seated themselves upon the banks of the spring and the young indian taking the child in her arms lavished upon her such fond caresses as mothers give while the negress endeavored by various little artifices to attract the attention of the young Creole. I had approached the group and was contemplating them in silence, but my curiosity was probably displeasing to the Indian woman, for she suddenly rose, rose, pushed the child roughly from her, and giving me an angry look, plowed into the thicket, plunged into the thicket. Okay, now what's my analysis here, right? Tocqueville is here showing how there's this common humanity that, um, just want to give myself a time check, there's this common humanity uh, that's shared by all. But when he appears, what happens? When he appears, sort of society intercedes, and that common humanity is somehow then a threat, and they have to disperse. I love Tocqueville. Okay, um, so when it comes to looking at um, how this Native American genocide happens, Tocqueville has a very nuanced, detailed analysis um, I put took a lot of time putting this one together. Normally I do this in class. I haven't had a chance to do that. Um, but um, uh, the first thing that happens is European contact intrudes upon Native American ways of life. So even before you're consciously, aggressively going after Native Americans, um, just the fact that families are arriving and starting to do things um, upsets the Native American way of life. Um, uh, this is Tocqueville's words, a few European families occupying points very remote from one another soon drive away the wild animals that remain between their places of abode. The Indians who had pre previously lived in a sort of abundance find it difficult to subsist. 
and still more difficult to picture to procure the articles of barter that they stand in need of, right? They don't have nature anymore. They can't get their stuff from nature, but it's hard to go buy stuff and barter for it, so they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. To drive away their game has the same effect as to render sterile the fields of our agriculturalists. Deprived of the means of subsistence, they are reduced to, to prowl agriculturalists, uh, to prowl through the forsaken woods in, in quest of prey. Their instinctive love of country attaches them to the soil that gave them birth, even after it has ceased to yield, yield anything but misery. At length, they are compelled to acquiesce and depart, they follow the traces of the elk, the buffalo, the beaver, and are guided by these wild animals uh, in the choice of their future country. Properly speaking, therefore, it is not the Europeans who drive away the natives of, Mer of America. It is famine, a happy distinction, which has escaped the ca ca casuists of former times and for which we are indebted to modern discovery. Tocqueville's right. That's irony that he's using there. Um, you know, he's, he's not... Uh, uh, he doesn't think that's okay. Um, in fact, he quite clearly knows that a genocide is coming, and some uh, I might have it in here. I don't remember if I have it in here, but um, he's quite not happy about it. The second thing that happens is you make the Native Americans dependent on American or European goods or products, right? Rather than hunt with a bow, you hunt with um, you hunt with uh, guns horses, right? The introduction of all of these European luxuries, which Native Americans didn't have the ability to pr produce themselves, meant that they were constantly then also over hunting to get these types of items. Third thing that happens, forced migrations, okay? Um, uh, think Trail of Tears, okay? So that was Andrew Jackson. Tocqueville saw one of these forced migrations. These are his words. Uh, it is impossible to conceive the frightful sufferings that attend these forceful migrations. They are undertaken by a people already exhausted and reduced, and the countries to which the newcomers betake themselves are inhabited by other tribes which receive them with jealous hostility. Hunger is in the rear, war awaits them, and misery besets them on all sides. To escape from so many enemies, they separate and each individual endeavors to procure secretly the means of supporting his existence by isolating himself, living in the immensity of the desert like an outcast in civilized society. The social tie, which distress has long since weakened, is then dissolved. They have no longer a country, and soon they will not be a people. Their very families are obliter obliterated. Their common name is forgotten. Their language perishes, and all traces of their origin disappear. Their nation has ceased to accept, except ceased to exist, except in the recollection of the antiquaries of America and a few of the learned of Europe. Sorry, I know that's intense, huh? It made me a little emotional. He's a whew, whew. I am. I should be sorry to have to have my reader suppose that I am coloring this picture too highly. I saw with my own eyes the many miseries that I have just described, and was the witness of sufferings that I have not the power to portray. Give me a second, I'm going to pause it. Okay, um, I had to take a quick break. Um, Tocqueville is such a beautiful writer, uh, and, you know, the it, if... <laughs> If the human suffering of millions of people doesn't occasionally bring a tear to your eye, then, um, you know, be a little more sympathetic already. So, um, uh, took a quick break, cleaned myself up. Um, I'm back at it. This one here should say factor number four. So I kind of, um, uh, 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 just me mess that up, but making and breaking of treaties. And so the story here, I'm not going to read the Tocqueville stuff, but, you know, basically the U.S. government would show up and agree, well, we're going to come this far, and, you know, how about we give you some stuff for it? And you would make an agreement with an Indian tribe or a coalition of Indian tribes, and then 20 years later, there's more people moving west, and you say, well, we want a little bit more. You come back and you make another one, or you just start moving in. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> um, that's, that's that. Um, <clears throat> um, similarly, um, 
when, and this is a really important point here, when Native Americans, whether in groups or individually, really wanted to kind of join and, and move, you know, join the nation, be a citizen, participate in a market-based economy, all of that, there were exclusionary laws that made it very difficult for them to do that. So, you know, on the one hand, you know, sometimes people, to be clear, sometimes people say like, well, you know, the Native Americans didn't really want to become settled agriculturalists and do writing and all of that. But that's not entirely true. Yes, if you, uh, uh, yes, a lot of them didn't particularly want to do that, but a lot of them kind of did. And think about the same tensions you saw in the mission communities where, the Spanish missions, where life was not good in the missions, but if you're an Indian, you might say to yourself, well, it's pretty clear that the Spanish are the wave of the future. And if I wanna have a good chance for myself and my family, I'm going to kind of have to accommodate to that. And so you go sign up for the mission. And even though it kind of sucks, it's boot camp like you think when you get to the other side, um, you'll have a set of skills that will make you uh, give you the ability to survive. Um, um, <clears throat> so um, I will I will read this a little bit. Um, if we consider the tyrannical measures that have been adopted by the legislators, legislatures of the southern states, we will be convinced that the, that the entire expulsion of the Indians is the final resort, result after which their efforts, the efforts of their policy are directed. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, well, that's good enough. I, sh I didn't really need to read that whole thing, but that's that's fine. Um, <clears throat> uh, number f number five, social. Oh, I doubled up number five too, so it should be number six. Um, social prejudice. Here, I'm using an uh, an example from the African American experience, so it'll link back to the earlier part of this lecture, but. On the social exclusion, African Americans and Native Americans really faced similar types of behaviors from the dominant white po um, um, uh, uh, population. This is what Tocqueville says. I said one day to an inhab inhabitant of Pennsylvania, be so good as to explain to me how it happens that in a state founded by Quakers and celebrated for its toleration, Free blacks are not allowed to exercise civil rights. They pay taxes. Is it not fair that they should vote? You insult us, replied my informant. If you imagine that our legislators could have committed so gross an act of injustice and intolerance. Then the blacks possess the right of voting in this country, Tocqueville says. Without doubt. How comes it then that, the polling booth, that at the polling booth this morning I did not perceive a single Negro? Ah. That is not the fault of the law. The Negroes have an undisputed right to voting, but they voluntarily abstain from making their appearance. A very pretty piece of modesty on that part, rejoined I. Why, the truth is that they are not disinclined to vote, but they are afraid of being maltreated. In this country, the law is sometimes unable to make its authority without the support of the majority. But in this case, the majority entertains very strong prejudices against the blacks, and the magistrates are unable to protect them in the exercise of their legal rights. Then the majority claims the right not only of making the laws, but of breaking the laws it has made, Tocqueville says. A man may st stand outside the prejudices of religion, country, of race. If such a man be a king, he is able to achieve su surprising revolutions in society. A whole nation cannot possibly rise, as it were, above itself. What's Tocqueville saying with that? He's saying basically, look, the majority of people were really super racist, and it's very clear, and um, they will behave that way whether it's legal or not, okay? Um, as we will see with the vigilance co uh, committees and things like that. Um, you know, again, bring it back to my note, um, you know, Negro is an old word, people don't say it anymore. We can excuse Tocqueville on this one because it was almost 200 years ago, and Tocqueville, quite frankly, was far ahead of the time as far as his analysis of race anyways. Um, and then lastly, there's two more things that we haven't talked about, 
or that Tocqueville doesn't sort of talks about, but, um, um, uh, you know, there you go. Um, <clears throat> uh, direct violence, simple. In California, we had Indian hunters. I'm going to talk about this in a second. And then also disease. So disease was a big factor in um, the mass death of, of Native Americans. Um, probably disease accounted for about a third of Native American deaths. We saw some of this in the book. Um, but it's important to keep that factor there as well. Okay, um, next, uh, I'm going to take another quick break and then lecture on a couple other things real quick. Okay, um, I now want to apply some of Tocqueville's analysis of uh, American mistreatment of Native Americans to some things happening in California. Okay, so I've given us this nice general way of thinking it's quite helpful. You're going to see a lot of similarities from what Tocqueville was talking about. You know, Tocqueville saw basically Plains Indians and Indians from the South being removed. Um, you know, in the time period we're talking about, it's actually, actually, now I think about it, it's about the same time period. It's, it's the 1830s, 1850s. Um, so maybe just a little bit later, what I'm going to lecture on here. Um, but it's quite similar. Um, I want to talk, I'm going to talk about the experience of the Yuki Indians. The Yuki Indians um, lived in Round Valley in Mendocino, okay? And this is, um, the article that I'm lecturing from is up online uh, in the Native Americans module. Um, but in, in the case of the Yuki, it's just one example, one particular application basically of what Tocqueville was talking about and we can see that we can see it now um, looking back so I'm going to sort of take it through take us through um, the genocide again I do think genocide is the right word here you can only wiggle around it a little bit with one-third of people died from disease yeah okay well hmm, two-thirds from not disease doesn't doesn't help you out that much um, <clears throat> uh, the genocide of the Yuki happened in four phases. Um, the first phase from 1854 to 1856. So just at the sort of as the gold rush is sort has sort of peaked and we're starting to have other types of settlements. People are coming into the Round Valley and they're actually setting up um, farms and ranches quite specifically. And the first thing that happens, just like Tocqueville said, is you put up a fence the game doesn't uh, 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 travel as much, and then you face food insecurity, okay? The second period uh, goes from 1857 to 1859. In this period, you have the Yuki Indians retaliating against, against settlers, so they start doing things like poaching livestock. Well, the deer in the game that they had hunted wasn't there anymore. You have enclosed herds of cattle and horse, and so they start poaching that. And in retribution for poaching, settlers begin to attack the Yuki. In the um, third period, um, we have open militarization of the conflict. The third period just takes place 1859. It's an intensification of the militarization. Governor John Weller, W-E-L-L-E-R, uh, actually hires sort of, they're not military, they're not um, army troops, there's kind of a hired gun, bounty hunter type situation, so you hire kind of private militia, but you do that. Um, so you have paid militiamen who uh, then are protecting the settlers, but protection basically means open assault on the Yuki communities. And then finally, you have a period where the Yuki are put into a reservation and federal authorities step in and put them onto a reservation. A um, uh, couple things to sort of get out there about Indian law at the time. Um, much like we saw in the Spanish period where uh, Indian laborers were kind of exploited and used in something close to basically slave-like conditions. 
California law at the time basically allowed forced labor by Native Americans, okay? Um, so there was, you could legally, if you saw a Native American being indolent, that meant lazy, you could legally force them to come work for you. And the, if the police showed up, you would say, well, he was sitting on the street being lazy, so I made him come work for me, okay? Um, um, there's a lot of Indian prisoner leasing, so, uh, you know, pay per day for the labor of somebody. Um, <clears throat> uh, and you could keep somebody in your charge for up to four months. So you could have a Native American in your charge for up to four months of basically free labor. All you had to provide was food, was room and food and, and room. Okay. Um, and at the same time, in legal proceedings, Indian testimony was not allowed. So if you're a Native American, you just weren't allowed to testify in court So um, against someone who's white. So if you're testifying against someone else who is Indian, Native American, you could, that, that could happen. But you're just simply speaking, not allowed to testify against whites. Um, in 1854, uh, California passed a law forbidding selling firearms to Native Americans. So you could sell them anything else, but you're not allowed to sell firearms. Um, let's see. Um, uh, and like I said, in Round Valley, the first phase um, happens with um, settlers coming in and enclosing the land. Just like Tocqueville says, the game don't come anymore. The food source for Native Americans dries up and they're faced with food insecurity. So in return, they start to poach livestock. Um, in the second phase, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, starting in 1857, um, the Yuki begin to retaliate uh, against settlers. So Yuki would poach uh, poach uh, cattle or horses, the settlers would in turn come out and shoot at the Yuki, kill a couple of them. And so you have an intensification of the conflict. And uh, the Yuki began uh, being more aggressive in their incursions. Um, and in return, the white settlers also become more aggressive in their retributions. Um, the white settlers in the valley in this time period also begin to publicly express uh, more sort of genocidal annihilationist sorts of sentiments. Oh, we have to get rid of them. Um, they're dirty, they're bad, this kind of thing. Um, you know, the Yuki are fighting back. They're fighting against people with guns, but they're literally fighting back with bows and arrows. There were, it's important to emphasize, and I'll show you some of the primary documents here um, in class um, one day this week. There were some, not everybody in California thought Indians were bad and deserving of this mistreatment, quite the opposite. There were a number of sort of publicists who wrote, who wrote letters to the newspaper saying this is wrong, we shouldn't be doing this. Frequently women, somewhat similar to Dame Shirley, you know, these are people just trying to survive, that kind of thing. Um, after the intensification of the fights between settlers and the Yuki in eight, from 1857 to 1859, um, you have the, uh, the sort of these militiamen step in. They, they named themselves the Eel River Rangers. Um, uh, Governor Weller sort of commissioned them from 1859 to 1860, uh, they were open Indian hunters in the Yuki Valley, uh, just going around looking for, so, so in the Round Valley, going around looking for settlement, settlements and wherever you, can wherever you can find, basically you attack. Um, uh, the, the, the leader of the Eel River Rangers was Walter J. Jarobe, J-A-R-O-B-E, 
and they charged the government for their services, a total of um, over $10,000 um, were paid to Jerobi and his men, and the federal government, in turn, later, for all of the different Indian hunting activities that California engaged in in this period, reimbursed California almost $3 million for the quote-unquote Indian War. Um, the Indian War was not a real war, and calling it a war is a misnomer. It's 1984-style uh, renaming of things. Um, after the open use of violence and, you know, large destruction of Yuki community already, then the federal government stepped in. So this is kind of similar, again, to what Tocqueville was saying, where you, know, you have state governments that do these things and the federal government kind of like steps in and does something different. But none of them are really dealing in good faith with the Native Americans. And it's kind of like um, it's just uh, passing the buck, quite frankly, passing the buck. So the, the federal government steps in, creates a reservation from 1860 to 1864. Um, uh, the Yuki are there in the reservation with other tribes as well. So they put a whole bunch of tribes there together. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was super corrupt. So money that would go in would very rarely end up being spent on the Native Americans. And so you had just lots of malnutrition. For example, if you're today... Doctor will tell you, eat 2,000 to 2,500 calories a day. That's because we sit around on our butts all day long. Um, at the time, if you're, an active, if you're an active person, so if you play a lot of sports, if you have to hunt your own food and gather your own food, you're moving around a lot more, you need a lot more calories. You need an average of about 4,000 calories a day if you are hunting your own food and living a more quote-unquote natural lifestyle. The food provided to the Indians in the reservation gave them approximately 800 calories a day. That's starvation, just no other way to put it, starvation, okay? Um, <clears throat> uh, the conditions were, they're basically just watched by uh, the cavalry. Um, they were also overworked, so they're expected to make their own buildings, do everything like that. They were way overworked and undernourished. Um, and of course, you know, there were complaints, oh, we should bring people to trial for, you know, mistreatment and stuff like that. But there was kind of a, um, you know, um, settlers wouldn't testify against each other. Okay, so a code of silence, if you will, amongst the settlers, even if you disagreed with the policy if it was your neighbor who did it, you're going to testify against your neighbor. That's a really hard one. You're really putting yourself out there. And yeah, it, it's wrong. But he's your neighbor. You might need his help, etc. And then you're not only pissing him off, but you're pissing off everyone who agrees with him. And maybe you need their help one day. And they don't feel like coming because you took them to court. Okay. Um, uh, now, you know... Why was there so much federal government in action? Let me sort of hit that real quick. Um, part of it was um, the coming of the Civil War. So there's other problems that at the time feel bigger. Um, Native Americans culturally, like Tocqueville said, just were kind of unseen. They weren't taken to be valuable. They weren't seen as full humans, okay? Um, also massive, not just corruption in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but then what money was coming in even before it was stolen was usually not enough to get done what needed to get done. And you also had um, basically sort of states' rights Democrats in the White House, right? So pre-Civil War, Democratic base was in the South. That was true until about 1965. Democrats were there's a strong Democratic base in the South until civil rights. And then, uh, well, Democratic Party signed up with civil rights and Southern Democrats started defecting to the Republican Party. That's an old story that's been around forever. Um, 
Um, now, in this case, in the California case, one of the things that's different about the American genocide of Native Americans versus, say, the, the Nazi genocide um, is that the American one really was directed by the people. The state was part of it, but the state did not come in and say, oh, look at all these undesirables, let's get rid of them. It was more your average American person really didn't care. And so the state was kind of like, well, we just want to stay out of it. And, uh, and then your average everyday person was actually pushing these kinds of projects. Okay. Um, um, uh, let's see. Um, in this case, it looked a little bit more like uh, what happened in Rwanda. So in Rwanda, you really had regular, average, everyday people turning on each other because of ethnic differences, not the state saying, you know, let's do a bureaucracy and have it all done that way. Um, I think that's pretty, that's it. That's my, so um, I'm sorry to be such a downer on this lecture, but it's a really important lecture and it's important that we see the treatment of Native Americans uh, for what it was in this time period. Okay, um, that's it. I'll have more coming.